Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS, and I'm so pleased to have joining me this morning the Chief of Staff of the Army, General James McConville. General McConville, welcome to CSIS. Well, thank you, Dr. Hicks. It's great to be here with you. Wonderful. Well, there are so many things we should be talking to you about today, but I know we have a limited amount of your time, and we, I really want to focus more than anything on the Pacific. Um, and I know you've come from the region relatively recently. The national defense strategy has prioritized um, so-called great power competition and especially China and Russia. But I think most people, when they think about the army, they're thinking obviously a ground intensive environment like Europe, and they're not often thinking about the Pacific. Um, is the Pacific really a priority for the army? And, and what does it mean if it is? Yeah, historically, um, you know, we're focused on Europe, but with the national defense strategy that puts the Indo-Pacific as, as the top priority, um, it's certainly a priority for us. And, and as we, we take a look and having uh, been out in the Pacific, that was my first overseas trip uh, as a chief in September of 2019. I've just did my first uh, trip uh, with COVID uh, out, out into the region. And when we look at, at the region, you know, there's great power competition there. And the great power competition is really about the people and the people reside in the land domain but the the, the secret to uh, or the solution to this great power competition is really a joint force solution and it's really with allies and partners all coming together for peace through strength and so when you talk about the joint force and then the combined the the allied piece let's kind of dig into those pieces starting with the joint piece what are the what do you think are the priorities you're hearing from uh, the joint force about what the army needs to be delivering or able to deliver, particularly in this context of the focus on, I think what some would call, have called the continuum of conflict or gray zone competition, scaling all the way up to deterring significant warfare? Yeah, I think I think it starts with, as we talk to the combatant commander, is great power competition. And so how do we help uh, the, the commander compete. And, and the way we do this is we provide certain capabilities. Uh, those capabilities uh, are things like the security force assistance brigades. So we can send them to the region. They can advise uh, and, and assist our allies and partners, develop strong relationships to help them uh, work the peace. And then we, we also have some other capabilities that we're standing up uh, a new organizations called multi- domain task forces that provide the ability to do long range precision effects. And then if we get to a, a conflict, they have the ability to do long range precision of fires, which will help deterrence. They're also enable uh, our other joint partners, uh, enable maritime or uh, air force maneuver against the inactive uh, anti-axis area de air defense capability. And what's the concept for how those multi-domain task forces would position or operate within the Pacific? Is that settled or something you're still working on? Well, that's something we're still working on as far as the exact uh, positioning. Uh, the, we do have some capability in extremely long range precision fires that give us certain effects. Um, but that capability as far as the exact position is still being determined. So that gets, I think, to the, the allies and partners piece, the, the combined forces piece. As I said, you, I know you've come from the region recently. You've, you've been there previously. What are you hearing from your counterparts uh, in the ground forces and the armies of the Pacific and what they're looking to have from the United States and from the Army specifically? Yeah, what, what they want is a, a, a strong um, friendship, a strong partnership. Uh, they, they want a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, they want to be able to uh, have a stable and secure area. They're very, you know, concerned about neighbors and, you know, no one wants to have any type of conflict out there because as we all know, there's so much trade going on that it's so important to the global economy. Uh, but they, they do want to, you know, it's in their interest to have a, uh, a safe and open Indo-Pacific and that's what they want us to help them with. 
Yeah, and there's obviously a significant concentration of army forces in Korea, in South Korea. I'm racking my head to think in other areas, are you finding there's appetite for more forces on the ground or is it more of the exer in the category of exercises and activities and engagements at the, at the senior level with, with you and your um, subordinates? Yeah, I think it's it's a range of activities. It, it starts at the international military education and training programs where they come to our schools. We work very, very closely there. Uh, some are interested in foreign military SEALs is, is purchasing equipment. So there's interoperability between us. Some are very interested, you know, once getting that equipment that we have advice and assist capability uh, that can um, enable them to be much better at the equipment. And, and in others, they want to train with us and they want to, some want to come to our combat training centers. Some want us to train with them in their country. So there's a variety of things we're doing to increase that capability between the partners, depending on what their desires are. Yeah. The other major dynamic in addition to the allies is of course, China itself, North Korea as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about in the case of China, how you think that U.S.-China dynamic, particularly as it relates, of course, to the Army and your mission set, what's, what does success look like um, in terms of how you position what you're doing with allies and with, as part of the joint force? You know, as I, as I talk to allies and partners in the region, the last thing that anyone wants is some type of conflict, you know, and so great power competition does not mean that there's a great power conflict and we all need to work uh, to avoid that type of thing. But at the same time, um, many of these countries, uh, they do want a free and open Indo-Pacific because you know, they, they need to fish, they need to have access, they need to be able to uh, do the things that they need to do for, for their economy. And so what they're interested in is, is really stability and security uh, in the region. And, and so all can prosper. China, most recently, probably for, for folks watching ground force efforts and the PLA uh, has gotten into border incursions with, with India. It's not the first time that those have happened. There's historical border disputes, but they were deadly. Um, and India itself is a growing element of the security environment. Can you, can you speak to the degree to which you're focused on the India-China dynamic? Well, I think in, in India is a very uh, in Important country in the region, you know, and we kind of just show we used to be, you know, the Pacific Command. Now it's actually Indo-Pacific Command, reflecting uh, just how important they are. And, and you know, India and 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 and, and us uh, share a lot of uh, common interests. And as a result, I think there's opportunities for that relationship and partnership. And uh, those discussions uh, are, are certainly uh, possible in the future. Yeah, and do you? What are the priorities that you've heard, if you've heard them yet, from the Indians? Again, with regard to their ground forces or cooperation with the army, because that's historically they've been focused on the India-Pakistan dynamic, and ground force capabilities are very important to that. Are they still quite focused on their ground forces? Well, I think I think you know. Again, I, I tend to talk to the ground forces. So as we as we talk to uh, the Indian chief of staff of the army, he's certainly focused on the ground forces. And then as we, we have discussions, we're looking for common interests and how we can uh, improve the relationship. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the trip you just came from. You, you met with your counterparts uh, in a couple other countries in Southeast Asia. You, can you speak a little bit about what you heard in the midst of COVID and in the midst of this competition between the United States and China? Yeah. It, you know, first of all, you know, many of the countries are, are very, very concerned about COVID. COVID is affecting the entire globe. And even during my travel, I was tested many, many times in, on national television and in Thailand, just to, just to make sure that as we move through the region, uh, that COVID is not, uh, is not spreading. So all the countries are very, very concerned with that. Um, it, we're all, you know, aggressively working on some type of vaccine and some type of therapeutic to do that. So they're very, very interested in what we're doing and what, you know, once we uh, discover that we, that we can share. And again, most, most of the partners, again, they're, they're very concerned uh, with some of the activities of the competitors out there that's going to limit their capability 
to do the things that they need to do for their economy to have a, a free and open trade. So that 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 is what their you know their their biggest concern. Uh, they they don't want to have to choose between partners when it comes to the economy because they're all dependent on the partners out there for the economy, and uh, you know, we have to respect that and respect their interests. With COVID being such a predominant factor in the environment, as you say, globally and certainly in that region, and the degree of Chinese. Uh, influence campaign activity around it. Are you are you looking at I would just call it health diplomacy as something that that the army can help provide to allies and partners who are looking for help on um, whether it's vaccine or therapeutics or logistics, anything like that. Yeah, I, th I, th I think there's certainly uh, opportunities there. You know, we as we build relationships. Uh, with, with, with these countries, and you know, certainly, if is you know, we're doing some very aggressive work with Operation Warp Speed to get uh, a vaccine, and, and part of that is even the therapeutics that you know that we can help treat that. And uh, with our allies and partners, once we we have that capability, we we certainly want to share. And we're doing some sharing right now within the region uh, that the Indo uh, PACOM Command is working with within his program to do that. But there's certainly that capability. So one of the big issues right now at this point is that we have the National Defense Authorization Act through both chambers. We obviously are awaiting the, the end game, if you will, which inv involves a conference and the president signature, et cetera. But we, I think we have a general sense of the overall budget top line. Um, and there's a lot of talk about regardless of what happens in the national election, um, there's certainly pressure on defense. Are you concerned about the Army's ability to deliver in the Pacific related to defense top line, or would you describe concerns in a different way? No, we, I mean, you know, we're in a, um, a major transformational effort in the United States Army. I, I, I suggest that every 40 years, we need to transform the Army. We did it in 1940, we did it in 1980, and now we're in two, uh, 2020. And we have some major modernization efforts going on. It's not just new equipment, it's new doctrine, it's new organizations, it's a talent management program. All these things are coming together. They're gonna to set the course for the next 40 years. They're gonna allow us to have overmatch and great power competition. So I think it's very, very important that we can continue these efforts in the top line and resources are gonna allow us to do that. What are the priorities that you have? I, I know you the, you have, of course, six modernization priorities. Welcome to speak to that. But but then more broadly, what are the priorities for that Army transformation? And again, maybe specifically thinking about the um, Indo-Pacific competition dynamic. Yeah, when we, when we think about it, because a lot of people think when you talk about transformation and modernization, you're just talking about new equipment. I think it's much more with that. And it really starts uh, with a concept for how we're going to compete and how we're going to fight. And at the joint level, we're coming up or we're developing or help develop a joint all domain operations concept that recognizes that in the future, we will be contested in every single domain on the land, in the sea, in the air, in cyber and in space. And our contribution that we're developing is a multi-domain operations concept. So that we're working very very closely with our joint partners to make sure that we're synchronized uh, with, with, our, with our concepts. And then from the concepts, we, we, we're developing new units. I mentioned the multi-domain task force that's going to give us long-range precision effects and long-range precision of fires. We're standing up security force assistance brigades so that every COCOM has this capability so they can advise and assist. We're taking a hard look at how we're going to do uh, information operations in the future because we know that our competitors are doing disinformation operations uh, all the time. And, you know, we, we, we're taking a look at how we train. We're going to take advantage of the technology, you know, so we where we used to have um, what we call dirt training areas, combat training areas. Now we have cyber ranges so we can you know, learn, you know, practice what we're doing in cyber. We're using virtual reality and augmented reality to train our, tro uh, our soldiers to take advantage of that. And then our six modernization priorities with long range precision fires, a, a new vehicle uh, to replace the Bradley. We have two new aircraft coming in on a network where we're tying all our sensors, the shooters together. And then on air and missile defense, 
Uh, we're, we're looking at lasers, we're looking at high powered uh, microwaves, we're bringing our sensors and shooters together so we can handle any type of threat. And then we're, we're doing things to make our soldiers uh, more lethal um, with some of the systems we're developing for our ground. So and really, I think most importantly is we're, we're doing a lot in talent management. You know, we, we talk about new stuff, but it's 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 moving our industrial age personnel management system uh, to a talent management system. Okay, well, thanks. Sorry, sorry, last year came up and, you know, we'll, we'll come back around. But, you know, as, as far as when it comes to uh, transformation and getting the force ready for the next 40 years, one of the most important things we're doing is with talent management. And what we're doing is we're taking an industrial age personnel management system that's been in place and moving to a 21st century talent management system that's going to allow us to compete for talent where we no longer manage uh, everyone as interchangeable parts. We actually manage individuals by their knowledge, skills, behavior, and even preferences, which is kind of blasphemous in the army, the idea that we want to know where people, what they want to do and where they want to go. Uh, but we think that's very, very important for the future. It'll get the people that we need in the right job at the right place. And uh, so we're moving aggressively ahead in that area. What, I mean, there, presumably there are winners and losers in a constrained budget environment. What are the areas where you feel like you can gain more efficiency than you have in the past, or you are deprioritizing to make room for this, these major pushes, both in funds, but also in, um, you know, the attention of senior leadership, the transformation of human capital takes an enormous amount of attention. What, what, sort of is allowed to maybe just be a little less prioritized right now? Well, the you know, one of the things that we're taking a look at is really how we divest. And this can be challenged as you look at, you know, some of the systems we have that that some would like us to continue to purchase. And we know that, you know, I've kind of discussed that we can't buy old new we can't buy new old stuff, so to speak. You know, we, we're gonna have to take a look at some of our systems. We can't have everything. And so that's why we have our modernization priorities. We know we need long range precision fires. That's our number one uh, priority. And so, you know, we're, we're developing hypersonic capability right now. We've been successful in our test. Uh, we're gonna have mid range missiles that can sink ships. We think that's very, very important for uh, the anti-axis air denial capabilities that, that we uh, may need to uh, face. And we're, our, um, tactical fires with extended range cannon, we're also increasing that. They have to happen. So some of the things that may be incremental improvements in our current systems, we're not going to be able to invest in, although some would like us to. Let me ask you one more question from me, and then I'll switch over to audience questions. There's been obviously a lot happening inside the United States in the last six months, and uh, particularly in light of the Black Lives Matter movement protests and then the civil military relations elements that were tied up, particularly in the Lafayette Square um, incident. You know, there's one could think there are challenges to the US brand overseas. Um, certainly we have challenges with the brand at home, but, but you've, as I said, just come from the Indo-Pacific. It's a region we wanna have influence in, in, in addition to Europe and elsewhere. Um, what's the army doing to do its part to make sure that the U.S. has a legitimate brand itself and that it actually can um, be um, influential with that brand overseas? Well, I think when it comes to uh, the military, we, we, we need to do uh, the right thing the right way in, in all circumstances. Um, you know, as far as employing um, regular army troops that's only to be done at the absolute uh, last resort and you know in, in this case we did not deploy regular army active troops uh, we need very work very closely uh, with the law enforcement and as we provide best military advice even the national guard should only be um, uh, employed at the last resort and i think um, certainly governors and, and mayors are taking a look at that and as we talk to uh, other countries and other militaries, we have that discussion and, 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 and you know, make sure they understand that the, the you know, we, the purpose of, of the United States Army is, is to protect the nation, not to police the nation. That's what we have law enforcement and that we should leave policing the nation to law enforcement. 
Also, I just add also, there have been quite a few diversity initiatives I know that have been brought up by, um, from Secretary Esper and then inside the services. Can you share a little bit about what the Army is doing in this regard? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and first of all, the, you know, the Army is uh, a, a very diverse uh, service. And it's not just about diversity. Really, to me, it's about inclusion. And I think that's, you know, diversity is numbers. You know, we, we have 20% of our forces African-American. That's 200,000 soldiers. Very, very important. 14% is Hispanic. Again, very, very important. And 18% are women. So that's a, you know, when you think of 180,000 women, 140,000 Latinos. So what we want to have is inclusion. So we've put together Project <laughs> Inclusion. Uh, we've been working this quite a while, but part of its talent management, how we compete. Uh, for a, a, a diverse um, uh, army and how we make sure that that diversity makes it all the way up to the top so people can see that. So we have programs in place for that. But but even when it comes to um, some of the programs as far as when we look at racism that, that is in the country when it comes to social injustice, what are we doing to get after that? We are getting after symbols. There's only, you're not allowed, you're only allowed to fly certain flags. You can't fly certain flags, things that are divisive. We're, we're taking a look at that. Um, uh, and, but on the systemic side, how do we make sure that everyone has a fair chance? Uh, we did a study on photos. We actually took photos um, out of our promotion boards because we found out there was some unconscious bias associated with that. Um, for our battalion command assessment program and for our colonel's assessment pro command assessment program, we do a blind board so people can't see what the person looks like because we want to make it as fair as possible and we're putting a lot of other systemic um, procedures and processes in place to really help that make sure that everyone has a fair chance in the United States Army. Great. Okay, let me get to the audience questions because we have uh, quite a few here. Sure. Um, there's one on um, the Army's propensity, the, the questioner would put it, to travel heavy. Uh, and the question is, what is the Army vision for ship-to-shore logistics in the Indo-Pacific um, that doesn't rely up upon port access that's exquisite, shall we say? Yeah, I think, you know, we have all types of forces. Uh, when, you, when you look at from light forces to aerosol forces to airborne forces to quite uh, heavy forces, and each comes uh, with a logistical trend trail um, or tail and ideally you know the, the, the lighter you go the less you have uh, but it also brings with it less combat power so what we're doing is tailoring our units and our logistics uh, to cut down the tail the other thing is is how we do logistics we're taking advantage of a lot of the technologies that play so additive manufacturing so you can actually make your own parts so you don't have to bring a whole bunch of parts you can make the one that you need putting artificial intelligence systems on our weapon systems so you don't change parts until you absolutely need to get that type of feedback and then you have a system that only brings the parts uh, forward that you need. We're doing much more on efficiency when it comes to fuel with vehicles and even looking at how we can go to hybrid type vehicles and, and save on fuel. So we, we recognize the, you know, the challenge of logistics and, you know, as we like to say in the Army, you know, amateurs study tactics and professionals study logistics because that really drives what we need to do. And, and, and we are getting after that. And again, moving into information age when it comes to logistics. Great. I also have a question on India and it's on the actually on the quad, which is the U.S., India, Australia and Japan, this concept of the four nations working together. What is your view on how India can contribute to a quad or I, you can broaden it to multilateral approaches with the U.S. to neutralize Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific? Well, I think all, all those countries are extremely important. Uh, in the region, and you know, as as we follow, you know, with we we'll leave the diplomacy and the and the you know the strategic relationships to the State Department. From us, what what I think we provide is good military to military relationships. And from my role, it's really with the chiefs of staffs. And again, you know, if you take a look at, uh, you know, the the armies uh, are very very important in those regions. So the chief of staffs tend to be very very important. So having a strong military to military relationship with my counterparts 
and finding out where we have common interests and, and where we can work together is very, very important. And, you know, with those chiefs, um, we have good relationships. Great. Another Pacific question, this one from Todd South of the Army Times. Could you please discuss your thoughts on stationing or rotational use of Army personnel as it relates to partner nations in the first, second, or third island chain defense model, for example? How critical is it to have U.S. forces inside the first island chain, such as Okinawa, or in partner nations such as Thailand? Station well, I, I, think, I, I think it's uh, very important that that we have relationships uh, with the countries inside the uh, first island chain, uh, you know, and, and we do. And as far as the ability to do exercises and train, we think that's very, very important. We think it's very, very important to have advisors uh, with our partners and allies. Uh, you know, we, we take a look at who we actually have uh, collective defense agreements with, you know, we, there's seven in, the, in, in, in our country as a whole, and five of those are in the region. So when you think about, you know, Japan, Philippines, the Republic of Korea, Thailand, and, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, those are the, you know, countries that we have defense agreements. So we think it's very, very important to make sure those partnerships are strong and that we work together. So I have another question on the region, and this one is about India and its potential for contributing through what's commonly called the Quad, which is uh, the notion of a US, Australia, Japan, India, multilateral um, set of networks that can um, work in the defense realm. So General, whether through the Quad or, or otherwise, what is your sense of how India might be best able to help uh, as the questioner asks, neutralize, quote unquote, China's influence in the Indo-Pacific? Well, I, I do think that India is a very important country in the region. I think we have recognized that as a country by defining the uh, Pacific as Indo-Pacific right now. And we do have defense agreements with Japan and Australia already. And I think that um, adding uh, India, if, if they were willing and they could make this the, the agreement, that would be very, very uh helpful for the stability and security in the region. Great. Okay. And uh, just a few questions, a couple on um, basing arrangements. We, we've talked about some of these, but one specifically on the Europe, the, particularly the Germany basing decision. Uh, and the question reads, as stated in the Pentagon's strategic approach, the region, uh, the Indo-Pacific region is DOD's priority theater. How will this affect U.S. Army force posture in Europe in the foreseeable future? To what extent is the Trump administration's decision to withdraw troops, some amount of troops from Germany related to this? And what kinds of capabilities are critical for deterring Russia um, that, the, that the Army should still be providing? Yeah, I think uh, when we, at least we look in the Pacific, uh, we, we know that uh, there's been some announcements uh, made actually today on units that may be coming out of Europe or going back to Europe. And what we're gonna to have to do in the army is do a, a posture review. But you know, right now we have a, enough forces committed uh, in the Pacific uh, to do what we need to do. And what we're doing in the army is actually developing those new units that we think are critical, like the multi-domain task forces that we think in the future are gonna provide us the capabilities that we think we need for long range precision effects and long range precision fires uh, if required in the region. And I think the questioner was also interested in what European, what capabilities would you like to see Europe developing in light of the fact that the United States has set the Pacific, Indo Pacific, as its priority theater? What would you hope others can provide in support of the common security goals we have in Europe? Well, you know, we'd, we'd like um, all the countries uh, to um, work very closely together uh, as we take a look at um, competition. Again, we're, we're, you know, we've got great power competition going on in Europe. Um, I think each country uh, doing their fair share and, and having a strong military uh, that can work together is a very, very strong force to deter any type of malign activities uh, in Europe. And so we, we want everyone to contribute. We want uh, the interoperability. One of the things I talked about in the future concept is you know, we're, we're talking about a joint all-domain 
command and control capability, but really we need to bring the partners into that. As I talk to uh, my uh, European counterparts, uh, they all want to be part of working together and the command and control capability is very, very important that we are interoperable so we can work together. So we have one last question and it's on um, intermediate, intermediate range forces. And the question is whether you would be supportive in the Indo-Pacific of land-based uh, capabilities for strike that fit in that definition, whether preemptive in nature or uh, defensive. Well, I think we, we, we you know, we, we want is we, we want to have capabilities. I, I talked a little about this before when it came to long range precision fires. We are developing a hypersonic capability, which has a very long range. We're developing uh, mid range capabilities that will have an anti ship capability. We, we certainly want to uh, bring uh, to the national leadership um, options uh, that they can use if required. Uh, for an anti-axis area denial capability. And then the question becomes where their position and where their posture uh, would be a decision that would come later. General Conville, you've been so gracious with your time. I, I just want to ask one last question and it loops back to your earlier comment on concepts and transformation and all the elements that go into it. And you mentioned the joint uh, concept being developed as well as the Army's efforts. Is there, do you have a sense of the timeline for the process, at least the first iteration of the process of the concept development and what we might look for for signs that those concepts are beginning to influence organization design, as you mentioned, and modernization? Yeah, what, what we see right now is really, it, it's happening as we speak. There's a lot of um, experimentation uh, going on over, even monthly, even during COVID uh, over the next year. So, you know, the concept is being developed, but it's really being developed based on experimentation. So we're bringing together uh, joint forces elements and making sure uh, that they can work together and conduct um, multi-domain type operations. So you can have air, you can have ground, um, you know, long range precision fires and, and we're all working so we can tie all our senses and shooters together and we're experimenting to make sure we, we can see that work and that's helping drive the concept that we're developing. Well, I really want to thank you for your time talking about the Pacific, talking about what the Army has as priorities. It's a very challenging environment um, and it's probably just going to get more challenging. So I'm, I'm really grateful that you are there at the helm at the Army and for everything that your soldiers are doing. Um, everyone, please uh, help me in virtually thanking General James McConville, Chief of Staff of the Army. Have a great day. Oh, thank you, Dr. Hicks. It was great to be with you.